Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast. This is a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to cross the path that, you know, that when you find yourself on that path of communicating with images, we think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Droz. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I am a user experience designer, and I do some coaching related to career and collaboration stuff, and I make video games. How are you doing, Jersey? I'm doing okay. I am uh, settling into my new home. You can see behind me that we, I've begun like making my office into my own personal space a little bit. Uh, happening in drips and drabs here because like we're also, Ann and I had this brilliant idea when we got our house and we said like, let's make it overlap with the apartment uh, lease that we have. So we have a, uh, a month and a half to move and we could take our time. And mm -hmm. now we're like three weeks away from the end of the, the lease. We're like, oh, I'm so tired of moving. <laughs> I wish we would have done oh, no. it in one big swoop instead of like this little piecemeal thing we've been doing every weekend for the past you know month <laughs> or so. Uh, but but it's good. It's good to have like a studio space again. Um, I mean, anybody's been watching the show for the last couple months or last actually year and a half. I've been in a. We were in a really tiny apartment for a while when we first moved to Columbus, and now it's like I just feel this abundance of space. How are you? Well, uh, you know. Uh, doing great, not dealing with the move uh, situation. That's been a few years, but, uh, you know, definitely working on the whole, uh, you know, keeping the family, I don't know, happy, healthy, engaged in, you know, amid sheltering and the pandemic. That's still, uh, that's a big thing. Ongoing concern. <laughs> mm -hmm. So still happening. <laughs> Looking forward to, you know, remember, looking forward to looking back on this and being like, like, oh, okay, I've got a few store ideas or something from all this experience, but it's all kind of crunched and crammed and, and flying by. Thankfully. Yeah. Or I don't know. Yeah. Try I, to be I, thankful. I know we were, we're, everybody's been talking about this, but like time is moving in a very, very strange way where like some things take longer than, feel like they take longer than ever. And some things are like, well, wait, wait a second. Was that, two, only, was that two weeks ago now? I thought it was yesterday. Anyway, um, that's also, this, there's going to be a lot of writing about this time, I'm sure you know, about the experience of this, this particular period of time. Um, mm. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's intense and it's ongoing and I'm sure it'll come up in future Lean Into Art episodes. For those who are new to this show, um, we, we're, we've been experimenting with streaming on uh, our Discord uh, server now instead of on Twitch or on YouTube. Just playing around with that for now, just seeing what that's like. And the, the format of the show is we usually like have a couple of sections. Like there's a section at the top about what it looks. We pick a topic and we try to like really focus on it for a full hour. Um, first half is like what it, what it looks like. Second half is how we think about it. We're doing something a little bit different this time. Um, speaking of the Lean Into Art Discord, we uh, there was some talk, some some chat going on in there about digital painting and the different affordances of different apps. And then you were chiming in in the Discord about some experimenting that you've been doing with digital drawing apps and uh, came up with this idea, rather, it, it, it occurred to me that like, hey, this could be a topic is like thinking about, um, oh, how would I put it? Affordances, efficiencies in digital drawing, um, ways mm -hmm. to find, um, like one of the things, that one of the, the discussion threads that, that came up was like, uh, discovering more efficient ways to do things. And then your, your particular posts were about automation. And I was like, that's an interesting idea. It's like, let's just go through a few little things that we found in digital drawing apps that make things move a little bit quicker, more efficiently, more automated. What do you think about diving into that? I mean, you've already said yes, but it's like... <laughs> <laughs> not I am abandoning ship. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I'm here for this. Okay. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's go. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see that. I mean, you've got uh, the, a lot of Clip Studio paint things to explore. And, and uh, yeah, that's an awesome tool, which happens to have some automation built into it as well. So this is, man, this will be fun. All right. Well, then let's hit some music so that we can start the transition to our next section. Yep. Okay, we are now in the first part of the show, uh, and we're going to start with Clip Studio Paint. Um, so I get I get the first chunk. I got to make sure I got my pen I can draw with. Um, 
So let me pull up my notes as to what things we're going to talk about, like as far as like efficiencies of the Clip Studio Paint. We've done a lot of episodes about this app. I've spent the last, I just realized it's been like seven or eight years now I've been using this application almost as like, if not exclusively, as like one of the main tools in my um, my art, what would you call it, my toolbox for, for making comics. And uh, it's not funny. Yeah. Um, it, it's you, this parts and pieces of, of your adventure uh, adopting this tool. It's totally chronicled in Lean Into Art, right? Yeah. Because we were um, like right around 2012, there was maybe some curiosity and dabbling, right? But then this gradual, um, you know, deeper jump in. Yeah. And you said seven years. I think it's that's probably, it took probably about a year of that dabbling transition to, to, to fully dive in. And uh, it's uh, um, it's, it's just kind of funny that because if you think back, it was, you know, we've had topics like um, thinking about toward a paperless um, workflow and That's right. you, th you know what I mean? Like rewinding back that far, it may seem like, oh, there was never a time when we didn't have some kind of drawing surface everywhere somehow. Right. That was digital. Um, but yeah. It's, it's, yeah, um, I remember, yeah, actually it was it, it was it the here. It, yeah, it was the the Galaxy Note 10.1 that I was so excited about cuz it was this, it was like basically it was what the iPad Pro eventually became, right? With this idea of like this really lightweight thin surface with a pen that you can draw on, you got pressure sensitivity. And what was that? That was like 2014, 2015 when the Galaxy Note 10.1 came out and I was like, okay, this is pointing to something exquisite <laughs> uh just having like super flexibility no i mean like real quick actually i gotta switch back to the to, to our other camera because i do want to make one quick point about this again given that you started us on this road of talking about like going towards a paperless workflow you know it's like what's funny is i just did a live stream yesterday where i took this little sketch that i did while i was waiting at the um, car dealership for like service on my car and then I took it into Clip Studio Paint, and then I penciled it. I don't know how well that's going to show up, but, you know, it's like... You oh, yeah, just, okay. It's light blue, okay. Yeah, I just printed out non-photo blue. So it's like, what's happened is, is like I'm doing like this, this trade-off back and forth. And as a matter of fact, uh, so like I'm not going pure digital on, on almost anything. It's, it's really become an amalgamation of using both. And like this example I have on screen is from a Bear and Bond Bear pitch that I was working on a while back. And uh, yeah, the, the, it was penciled in Clip Studio Paint, printed out on watercolor paper, paper, inked with brush pens, scanned, then imported back into Clip Studio Paint, and then painted uh, with watercolor brushes in CSP. So, so yeah, um, that's, that's the thing that I'm like most thrilled about, about the time we're living in right now, is that like just it's mix and match your tools. You just got so many more than what we used to. Anyway, um, but some of the efficiencies we were talk like, talking about in the Discord is like one of them is, and you know, a lot of people know about this, but not everybody does. So it's worth bringing up is what are called clipping layers. So what I've got a finished page of art here, but I'm going to like zoom in on a corner so I can just do like a little bit of a, a drawing here so we can, I can demonstrate this idea of what clipping layers are. And I believe these are in Photoshop as well. But um, supposing I take and I just flat out a quick little shape. And I'm going to go ahead and just like make this into like a weird purple little teddy bear because I'm thinking about bears because of Baron von Bear on the screen. So, you know, when you're flatting, you're trying to do something with no anti-aliasing on the pixels. And you want the colors to be... Which is easy to do on in Clip Studio Paint where it's just a, um, it's a bitmap layer or the, um, what, what is it called? The, 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 there's a color depth setting when you create a new layer. Oh, and we, it's it's just like it, that's one of the things where Photoshop has all these abilities too. But it there it's really like a, a it's a ta it's a really on the surface accessible quick thing um, as you're creating a new layer in yeah, Studio Paint. And and like all these drawing apps, there's like a zillion ways to do everything because you can also like just adjust the anti-aliasing right on your brush. So I'm down in the lower left messing uh, around with my brush yeah. settings and you turn anti-aliasing all the way off, and boom, now we've got you know just pure color pixel, pure transparent pixel. Right. So once if I you did that with the layer, the layer would be just black and white. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't yeah, matter what color you'd have. Monochrome layer. So. Right. Ah. 
So so now I've got my flat layer, and like if you want to mess around with like so when I do my flats on um, something like this, I'll actually, you know, I'll do all the flats on one layer, and then I just use my magic wand tool to like select each color to do the shading. But supposing that you want to put, you know, each individual flat on its own layer, which I've done on some projects in the past, you can create another layer over top. So I got layer one. Here's my. I'm just gonna call this flats. And layer two, I'll call shading. And then you can, in the layer palette, right up in the top left, you can select, click, clip to layer below. Let me see what happens if I right click on it in Windows. Uh, can I do it from here too? Uh, selection from layer, layer mask, convert layer, merge layer below. No, I don't think I can. Looks like they'll, can I also do it from the, from the context menu at the top of layer palette? Uh, I'm not finding it. So you, you're going to want to make sure that you have this, this toolbar on at the top. I don't know how else to do it. There's probably another way. Um, but this toolbar at the top, the, the top left icon. Well, let's also look in our layer palette real quick. Layer. Just as a heads up, the, me the menus aren't actually showing up on the. Uh, oh, they're not. Okay. That's good to know. It's, um, Thank you for telling yeah, me that. Capturing the specific window. I mean, you're okay. narr narrating the, the menus. Like, I can see them in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, anyway, if you have this toolbar at the top, you can actually uh, toggle on um, the, the property bar, the command bar, and the set command bar below. So, you want to make sure your command bar is selected by clicking the... Uh, hamburger icon right next to your layer menu and then you'll get this little bar at the top where you have you know your reference layer draft layer lock layer lock transparent pixels but the one we're messing with is the one that's labeled click clip to layer below and when i click that there's a red bar that appears next to that layer that shows that indicates that it's only going to let me draw um, in areas where there's ink below it so in other words this pink bear i made is pink pixels on a transparent layer and so if I take and I take like a, a darker shade of pink and let's grab like a, a softer brush now. And if I try drawing, I'm going to try drawing to the right of the bear. It's not letting me see anything. But as I approach the bear, it's letting me draw wherever. The, it only shows the ink I'm drawing where there's something underneath it. If I turn off that clipping layer, we'll see, oh, there's all the stuff I drew, right? I could draw all day long a whole bunch of different colors. And let's change to green. And so on, and I squiggle and in zigzag all over this. And then if I toggle back on, clip to layer below, it'll just hide anything that's over top of transparent pixels. So why is this important? Well, I'm going to clear this layer. So if I go ahead and select that color, choose the shading color, and then I get a nice big soft brush, I can go in here and shade around it without having to worry about being close to the edge. And just just, so it just speeds things that's up. It's just so beautiful. I mean, yeah. that, that is such a nice tool that, I mean, it's, it's like instant. I mean, imagine if you could walk around the physical world doing this where you're like, <laughs> I want to not have my paint affect that and that, and yeah. then just paint yeah. as big as you can. And it doesn't affect the things. It's amazing. You know, it's uh, all that's all that blue tape that you have to do when you paint a room. That, uh, <laughs> that's exactly right. be a thing. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. So the other the other thing I want to point out is um, Ray Friendin is somebody I've talked about a lot on the show. Ray Friendin makes a bunch of Clip Studio paint brushes. He's actually running a sale right now on his brushes, and uh, so it's Friendin.com. F R E N D E N. At the time of this this broadcast, he is, you know, uh, posting. Mm -hmm. you, you get yeah, I have those brushes too. He's not a sponsor. That's just showing love. But yep. uh, it's cool. They're, but, they are pretty great. I've just gotten a lot of value. Uh, out almost of overwhelming, though. There's so many. There's you know a lot. what I mean? Like, that's, that's the mixed bag of the friend of brushes. It's like, I'm rich in brushes. And then it's like, oh, my gosh, what brush do I possibly pick for this task? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's hundreds of them. And I've only used, like, maybe a dozen, right? And, I, and I've, I try every once in a while when I have some time to draw just to experiment a little bit with these different brushes. Um, but the ones that I want to mm -hmm. point to here that are worth getting if you get them are his watercolor brushes. Um, because this, this Baron Von Bear comic was painted entirely with his watercolor brushes. And it looks, 
extremely natural. Um, it's pretty darn close to the real thing. Like when you look closely at the texture on the colors mm. and the way they mix. Um, that is so cool. It looks really great, right? Like I, I was, I was really surprised at like the quality of, of like the analog looking quality I was able to get. You could still tell it's like, it, it's not a hundred percent, but it's darn close. Well, it's, yeah. yeah, it is really close. It does a good job of, of that, that sort of realistic brush simulation that uh, a little bit of texture, a little bit of the impression of the translucency of, of, uh, of water, right. Where mm -hmm. the, the color is slightly pooling in, in places and whatnot. And it certainly is an, it's an instant upgrade from like a flat look, um, mm -hmm. for, depending on, on your aesthetic needs. But right, right. Yeah, for this particular really comic, really nice. I wanted it to feel a little bit old timey because it's like a spook. He lives in a spooky old house. So I was trying to think of like, well, what kind, how can I make this look like natural media as much as possible while allowing me to have all the flexibility that I need to get this thing done fast? Because this is also about looking for ways to level up and speed up uh, the work, um, not to do it sloppily, but to get minimum viable product, right? So in this case, the way I did it is, so if you do get his brushes, here's how I employed them. It's like, so I have a flat layer. I'm gonna make two more layers above it. And flats layer, I, ass I assign it to be what's called a reference layer in Clip Studio Paint. And then you can take the magic wand tool and you can say, refer to other layers. And I can select what layers to refer to. You can say, refer to all in the bottom left there, or you can say refer to the reference layer. So now when I'm on another layer um, and I take that magic wand tool and I tap on Baron Von Baer's fur color, even though I'm on a transparent layer, it's referring to the layer below and I can add more to it, add more to the selection, go to my watercolor brush and let's choose a color, a light source or a shadow color. So like it's, it's a yellow room. So the light source is like, generally speaking, going to be like a warm color. So I'm going to choose like a cooler color for the shadow. Um, and then with that watercolor brush, I'm just going to scrub around. Oh, come on. Where's, which watercolor brush? Which, just to highlight that, that's a yeah. nice little um, heuristic or pattern rule of thumb thing where if you, if you just, if you have warm light, do cool shadows, uh, cool light, warm shadows. And it, um, it instantly, it's, it's evocative, like because of how we see and perceive the world, like there's a, um, um, there's an instant at atmospheric appeal to it, mm -hmm. even though well, it's, you know, it, you're yeah, dealing it's, with 2D art. It's, it's a really nice thing. Just remember to just sort of be opposite light and shadow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and this, this, this comes from the way we perceive color too. And like, like, uh, uh, adjacent colors so like and i noticed this the first time i encountered it in art class i was like what no way and then i went for a walk and i was walking in this neighborhood where they had those um yellowish lights to diminish um it was called light pollution and they were very yellowish orangish kinds of lights and then i looked at the shadow of the of the lamp post and i was like yeah i see blue in that it totally looks like blue you know it is there blue in that you know, I don't know that that's that, but like my eyes perceive that I'm making up that difference somehow. So, so if I'm going to use a, like a warm color, uh, an orangish yellow for the light source and go to my watercolor brush again and just scrub around inside this flat color and it gives that impression. And that's a little too warm. I would lighten up a little bit more, but you get the idea. That's how I, I colored this and it, and it, the pages went really fast. Like I didn't spend more than, I don't think like an hour, hour and a half coloring each page, just doing it this way. So you have, I usually have a, uh, a highlight and a shadow. Oh, actually in this case, no, I just did all the watercolors on one layer. Look at that. So, wow, you were moving. I, I was, I was really trying to like get like maximum efficiency on this. So yeah, I just like had uh, a highlight color and a shadow color selected in my color. Um, what do we call this? My my swatches. So like in my Amazon Academy or let's go to Rockets. I think I had it in Rockets. Didn't I? Yes. So I have a shadows color here mm. and a highlights color there. And I just use that as like a global light and shadow on the page um, with the watercolor brushes. So... So there's that. That's another speedy thing is like using um, some really nice pre-made brushes and just using the, um, what's it called, reference layer 
uh, toggle so that you can like, so if you have all your flats in one layer, you just like quickly just select each color from another layer and then edit them. And then obviously the advantage to that is that like, if you decide that you don't like any of the shading, you did, you just throw it out and you don't, you're not, you still have your flats. Um, this is another one that I really, really dig in Clip Studio, and it's something you can do in Photoshop, but like the way I've always done it in Photoshop requires a lot of steps, and this is literally like a one-button thing in Clip Studio Paint. So um, when I'm importing my art, so here's that drawing I showed earlier uh, that I you know, did at the car dealership. I scanned it on my computer, and what I can do now is go to if I like well you could see that it's got black pixels and white pixels right it's 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 opaque I can set it it's layer mode to multiply uh, whoops wrong layer do it on the right layer set it to multiply and then the white will be transparent and I can see through it but if you want to do things like color holds where you actually like isolate the black line so that you can color just in the black line um, you need to make the white pixels transparent so in Clip Studio Paint it's literally you just go to edit convert brightness to opacity oh you can't see the menu mm -hmm. you can't see them. so like if you go up nope. to your menu I can, we can see it in our inner minds though you know, so use, you go in to the edit. theater of your mind edit convert brightness to opacity it takes a second and what it does is it converts the layer are you doing it there you go it converts the layer to a black and white layer and deletes all the white pixels so now if i hide everything else below it there we are and also so, not a sponsor, but like Clip Studio Paint, I mean, it's clearly, it's a tool that's easy to fall in love with when your your job is to um, to do like any kind of illustration. Like it, it prioritizes that above everything else. It's like, hey, photographers, you're wonderful people. That's great. Photoshop is more general in its, in its nature and, and whatnot. But this specialization, so friendly. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I feel like someone's like, hey, I did this for you. <laughs> and I, I just want to, I'm like, thank you. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yes, that, that is how it feels this to use so this. so nice. Yeah. And so now that it's black lines on transparent pixels, it's trivial for me to just lock transparent pixels in the layer palette and then I can go in and do color holds like just by painting over top. Oh, I'm using my watercolor brush. Let's use my more opaque brush. And it's trivial for me to start, you know, converting. Oh, there we go just by painting over the lines. Um, and then you can also, you can change the expression, the expression color of the layer. I can turn it into a grayscale layer. Um, and so that blue suddenly becomes gray, but it preserves the information. So if I switch back to color, it'll automatically switch back to whatever color changes I made. Um, and you can change it to a monochrome, which means that it'll be pure black and white pixels. So it, like, it's basically like running the threshold filter in Photoshop. Um, and that's called the expression. It's color? above yes. So that's in your layer property menu. And then when you're on the layer, mm -hmm. if it's a raster layer, you, like if you bring it in as an object, it won't work that way. But if you have if you have it as a raster layer, you can toggle between. And I'm seeing if you can. Yeah, you can't see the menus as I as I uh, select them. But in the layer property menu, like literally right next to my head, like right there, um, there's an expression mm -hmm. color. It says mm -hmm. color. If I switch to gray. It turns it to grayscale, and we can see that you know that ghost character in the background is now gray. If I switch it to monochrome, it turns it into just pure black and white pixels. So, but it, it keeps all the information so that you're not you don't have to undo. It's still there. You can make a whole bunch of changes. So I can like switch this to monochrome, make a layer underneath it, go ahead and color in that layer. First, let's turn it on. You know, and color all I want in this layer. Make another change. Add a little red here. Make another change. And then I can go back to this, this line art layer, switch its layer mode to color, and that information is still there. It hasn't gotten rid of anything, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's another one that I really like is the convert brightness to opacity. So it's under edit, convert brightness to opacity, and boom, now you've got transparent pixels and black line art for editing in, you know, in your comic. Um, Another one that I really like is in your navigator window. Most drawing apps have a navigator window. Um, even like, uh, what's it called? Um, Metabang, Metabang Paint, right? That free app that we've talked about on the show before. And something I like to do when I'm doing drawings is flip the canvas. And it's like, it's one button in the navigator menu to just flip the canvas. I do this throughout the drawing to check 
how I've got everything laid out. And like this particular sketch, like I already see some things that I would change on this just ever having flipped it. Um, and this is the mirror test, holding your artwork up to the mirror to see like what like some compositional or um, uh, symmetry problems that you might be having with the image that you're not seeing because you're you're used to you're looking at it from one perspective. So flip it, and then you can see it another way and see if anything needs to be adjusted in the composition. So that's another one button thing that doesn't actually flip the canvas. It just flips how you see the canvas, right? Um, so your navigator window is another one that I would point to that it's really useful. And then I guess the final one I'd point to before we go to our break is um, another bit of the layer mode or in the layer property menu that's really cool, that's really sped up my sound design work is um, being able to put a border effect on a layer. So like, let's say I just draw a quick sound effect. And these days I like to hand draw my sound effects. Come on. It's running a little slow. Hmm. Okay. You're Mine's. writing boom. Writing really boom huge. in big yellow letters. And I wrote on a transparent layer so I can lock those pixels and maybe I can put a little bit of a brighter yellow in the center of it with a gradient. Whoops, that's too much. Let's go to circular gradient. There we go. So now it's like a little brighter in the middle where the vowels are. That's just the thing I like to do. Anyway, so going up to layer property menu, there is an above expression color. There's another couple options. There's border effect, tone, and layer color. If you click on border effect, it automatically creates a line around your border. And my edge color is set automatically to be white, but you can set it to be whatever, whatever you want by double clicking on... Oh, and you can't see this menu, but I it double click and it pulled up a color picker. And so when I mm. change the color, and we can see that I've got some stray lines that I put in there. I'm just going to erase real quick. But it automatically creates a border around whatever art you've got on there. And once again, this is something that is non-destructive because I can just turn that off anytime I want. Um, and that's called, you, you have a border color for the layer? For the layer, for anything that you draw on the layer. Wow. And so, and you could That's change, awesome. you could change its thickness just with like by changing, you know, adjusting the bar in the, in the layer property menu. Right. So, wow, this is a really fast way to like when I'm under like a lot of pressure to get like work, the work done. If I just need to draw a quick sound effect, you know, I'll draw it with a, with a brush and then I'll turn on the border effect and you could turn it off, you know, and turn it back on. It's just like a, a switch you can flip. There's other stuff in the layer property menu that's fun to play with, but I'm just talking like these are just like about like doing like quick, efficient things in your work, right? So, so there you go. Oh my gosh, those are some great efficiencies. So cool. Like, uh, yeah, the let's see the masking layer, reference layer, expression color, convert brightness to opacity, navigator menu has a bunch of goodies like flip canvas and then border color for the whole layer oh my gosh yeah it's pretty cool i mean like again this is about doing things quickly because like one thing that i i sometimes i get persnickety about is when i do the border layer it has to it has to be one color so sometimes i like to do a border that has a gradient in it sometimes right so like it doesn't always speed things up for me but like i would say 99 percent of the time if i need a quick sound effect that is the way to do it just like hand draw it you know, as I'm working on a tablet that I can actually draw on and then ta toggle that border color on real quick, pick an associate color that like feels right to the, to the sound effect. And now I'm done. I've drawn a sound effect in like four seconds, you know. Um, and that's how I got those Baron Von Bear pages done so darn fast was doing it that way. So um, hmm. that's some good stuff. Um, and it's, what's funny is like, I don't think we've covered much of any of that. There's a little bit of like, we've, you know, reference layer at some, at, you know, some point in the past, the, uh, the classic we love to mention is the, um, the eraser, the vector eraser, mm -hmm. um, mentioned that one, a lot of love for the vector eraser. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, but anyway, this is cool. Thank you. Cause I did not know a lot of these and, uh, Oh, cool. I'm glad. Um, very useful. Well, and like I said, there were, there are people in the, uh, the discord who are saying like they hadn't tried out clip studio paint yet. So hopefully that'll be something that'll get them to like, at least give it a, give it a try. Um, you know, the clip studio paint has its, its drawbacks. It doesn't have CMYK support. 
it doesn't have if you're like really in the Adobe ecosystem and you use like things like InDesign to do your pagination of your files, you know, like they've intentionally designed a suite that interoperates really, really efficiently. So like there's, there's efficiencies that you lose by switching to something like CSP, but there's also other efficiencies you gain. So that, that's, that's a trade. Trade-offs is another topic we talk about on the Lead to Art cast. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, there, it, there's always context. And uh, sometimes we learn more about our context by bumping into the wrong tool and saying like, eh, it's not for me, but uh, I don't know. Uh, we've tested the heck out of this one over the years. It's, it's pretty good for a lot of, a lot of illustration tasks. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it's interesting too, that whole Adobe ecosystem. That's one of the reasons why, like what we're, we're about to talk about next, that um, why I ended up exploring other ways to, to do automation and scripting. Because mm. I have, I have for now left the Adobe Creative Cloud system. Oh, fun! Yeah, this this has been a an ongoing sort of um, scuffle with me too. Is like I spent the better part of the last couple of years trying to find ways to get out of that ecosystem. Because when I switched to Windows after I had a CS six license that I purchased with my own money, it was not pirated, you know. And I was like, well, wait a minute, but it's only a Mac license. I can't take it over to my PC. This sucks. Oh, and if you want to get a new one, got to pay on a monthly basis. I'm like, I get it. I get what you're doing. I'm not on board. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I know that we're going to be talking about some uh, ways to break out of that system. And I'm probably going to be cheering in the background the whole time while we talk about it. So are you ready to take a break before we do that? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. Okay. Well, in about a minute and a half, we're going to explore ways to um, automate art using scripting and using tools that are not in the Adobe ecosystem. Before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this show possible. And those are the people who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you say, hey, I believe in Robin Jersey and I believe in what they do and I want to make it more sustainable... You can support us on an ongoing basis for as little as a dollar a month. You could also do it as a one-time contribution. You just show up, get you know, do a contribution, participate in in all the behind-the-scenes stuff, all the exclusive content that we make for people on Patreon, and then you know you can cancel your subscription at any time. But I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on an ongoing basis. It means a lot to us. So Greg Horvath, thank you, Greg, for believe, believing in us and what we do. You can find Greg on Twitter at IGM Horv. Seven seven. Thank you, Greg. And Rachel Ross. You can find Rachel on Twitter at NYC Terrace. Thank you so much, Rachel. Longtime supporter of the show. And Becca Hilburn. Becca Hilburn, you can find on Twitter at Natto Soup. Becca's got a new Kickstarter going on right now that you, you could find out about by following Becca on Twitter at Natto Soup. And India. You can find India on Twitter at Old Swifty, an amazing animator. Thank you so much, India. And finally, Carrie Goble Billick. Thank you so much, Carrie. Another longtime and enthusiastic supporter of the show. You can find Carrie on Twitter at Mushin Girl. You can join them all at patreon.com slash lean where you'll find all the posts we make, all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want with fellow leaners, and it gets you access to the Patreon section of the Lean Into Art Discord, where we're streaming right now. Thank you to everybody there. It means a lot to us. It really does. Thank you so much. All right, how about we pick some transition music to get us over to the next section. My soundboard is so sluggish today. Okay. <laughs> how sluggish is it? <laughs> Makes the speed of sound more like, I don't know, the <laughs> snail and mashed potatoes of sound. Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, so do you want to... Joke formats have been around before Twitter. I don't know. <laughs> That's a... true, true fact. So let's, let's, um, let's hear about automation, Rob. What have you been working on? Well, okay. So this is not like... We have explicit about um, art automation in general episodes. And this is going to be sort of a dabbling in, in hodgepodge of some things that, that I explored because of how I lay out screens in video games I make. Um, when you, when you make a game in like unity, um, it's, it's a, uh, 
it's an all in one thing, kind of like the old days of, of flash, right. Where you have this, this editor that has, um, you know, visual layers and layout and all that stuff. But then you also have, um, well, code behind the scenes and you can kind of make it all glue together. Unity, unity 3d, uh, um, it works like that. And, um, so I don't need this as much for, um, like Guitar Fredder Deluxe, which I'm building in Unity, but like other games I make, like This Panda Needs You and Guitar Fredder Classic, which I'm now calling it, um, it's, you know, it uses essentially layouts from, from uh, you know, Photoshop files. I, um, I, I name layers based on like the, the object I want it to be on the screen and I position it in there and then I can export the art and the positions of all the art. And I didn't invent this or whatever. There was, there's, there was scripts in the whole Adobe ecosystem that I think um, there may have been like some rudimentary things for exporting that, that Adobe had a cool script, but then others actually um, went in and got metadata about the layers. Like what's the width of this layer? Um, that, that's important. The width, the height, the, you know, the, the position X and Y and all that stuff. Um, and and that, that becomes, well, once you know that, once you have access to the art, boom, you can load that um, in your code in a game or what have you. Anyway, so with that in mind, I, so I had scripts that worked in the Adobe ecosystem. You can automate all the Adobe tools pretty well with JavaScript. And um, like that's, we've, we've actually talked about that in the past on Lean Into Art. But if you are looking outside that ecosystem, uh, the options become, uh, let's see, thankfully there are options. But if you think, oh, hey, I'm using the Affinity apps, right? Because they do a pretty good job um, replacing Adobe capabilities. And then, uh, you know, that's for the workflow of the you know layers and manipulating all the tools and and layouts and so affinity photo affinity designer and then the publisher i haven't experimented with yet but it's on my radar um because it's a one-time purchase thing and um and it's a reasonable price too so here we go um so many needs are being met yet when it comes to automation those tools haven't um haven't approached that issue yet it seems like in forums and conversations, yeah, people talk about it, but it's not there yet. And here I am today wanting to do an update to Guitar Fretter Classic. So, well, um, I looked around. Uh, what else What else was there? Oh, yeah, you, you know, Clip Studio Paint has automations in it, but it's not fully opened up and opened up to be scriptable where you can compose your own logic and behavior to conditionally pick this, but not that, and then... Um, get the data you want, what, what have you, right? So um, it, it's almost like a watch me do this operation, record it, and you can play it back. That's what, that's what Clip Studio Paint can do. Um, other tools can do that as well. I mean, that's also baked into like Photoshop. But um, turns out, yeah, Jersey's showing uh, Guitar Fretter on the screen. So like all that stuff on the screen in Guitar Fretter for especially like the, like the, the pause button, and the, the the progress bar, the pos position of the, the guitar fretboard, all these little things in the UI, instead of me going into the code and saying like, oh, move it over 10 pixels, mm, move it back two more pixels, whatever. And, and doing this sort of in by hand, of course, it's way better, easier, faster to do this in a visual tool. So there we go. Um, uh, and okay, so what, what I want to demo. Oh yeah, so along my quest, I found, um, I found a tool that first didn't work for me and then I found a way to make it work. And that is, um, let me just switch over to it here. Um, this is called, it's called uh, PSD Tools and this is a Python library. So if, if you're familiar with, um, so what I just, what I launched right here is, is, um, is on Windows, right? So I'm, I, I'm across multiple operating systems now. I still am a, very much a Mac user, but I've been investing more in the Windows world recently. Um, I, I installed, you know, Python for Windows. You install Python for Windows, 
and you can you know launch this command prompt or if you like to navigate more generally you can reach the your python command from stuff like your git command prompt if you also install that too because it's a bash shell instead of like windows you know terminal and stuff like that so then here if i um I need to move this thing out of the way move this microphone um so let's see, what did I do? I, I, so I'm in a Python interpreter right now. All I did is at my command line is I typed, I typed uh, Python, um, which you can't see my mouse, but you can, oh, you Actually, can see my mouse. Can you see, you can, you can ah, see it. Excellent. So I typed Python, hit enter, launch this. So now, since I already installed this, so through pip, Python's install um, tool, I did pip install um, PSD tools, right? And so it, it, it added that. So now I can go into Python um, from the direct, because I'm in a directory with some guitar fretter assets. And so I can start to work with it. This didn't work on, on, my, on the Mac. And, and it's just because of environmental things. Sometimes when you have scripting and it depends on libraries, it depends on stuff in your, you know, all in your operating system. Sometimes things that are, um, are meant to be cross-platform don't always, you know, work so smooth and that, that I hit a few bumps. I'm sure that's on me and my environment on my Mac, but I almost walked away from this. So, okay, let me, sh let me show you how we can get, get an image loaded up here. So we do um, from PSD underscore tools. Whoops, I hit uh, caps lock by accident. I have too many things on my desk. All right, uh, from PSD tools, um let's see what do we want to do here um we want to import psd image whoops i'm in the wrong window now whoops import psd image and if that if we can hit enter and that works probably psd tools is installed correctly <laughs> so that's good so that now we want to go further and see so uh we want to load a, a, an image um Let's see. Let's let's do PSD image. So image equals IMG equals PSD image dot open. And then I know from the directory I'm in, um, I think there's an image called battle dot PSD Photoshop file, right? So boop boop. Will that work? It did. So I can do the Python thing to debug. You can type print. Note that, um, let's see. So my, no, I'm in Python 3, so I should do the parentheses. Ah, always a fun thing hopping back and forth between two, Python 2 and Python 3. Um, so print image. Let's see what we get out from that. Ah, so there's some, there's some data on that. So we can do four. Let's see if we can get the layers. Uh, for layer in, P, in, in uh, image. All right, so we did a for loop and then we'll do print layer. Like, can we get that data? So I'll hit enter and enter. Boom, it just did it. Cause so we're we're in a REPL. We're we're in a the a REPL is a is a command line that sort of reads what you type into it and immediately executes it, right? So we're just kind of creating a, a living Python program on the fly by by doing these this this situation. If we wanted to make a script, we would just save this in a text file and then run it by doing Python space, then the name of our text file. So here you go. Look at this. Look at this. All this lovely, awesome data that's ours. It's in like, I want to laugh evilly because look at this. <laughs> um, so we have access to all the layers, right? So what's cool is now I, I think I have a viable option. I almost walked away from, from PSD tools if you just, yeah, you do a search, search on Google for Python PSD tools, you're going to find this and, uh, you know, how to install it and stuff. But like, I can make a script to export the positions of all these things. I can even actually use this, this method. I don't have Photoshop installed on this machine. I could use this method to um, discreetly export the layers themselves too. So anyway, lots of power available uh, to me there, right? Uh, wait, 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 wait a second. So you're telling me that you could, with this script, without even having Photoshop on the, 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 the computer, you can export a layer from a layered PSD file. You could say, like, grab, okay, like, the we... flats layer. Okay, yes. 
What? So, yep. Um, let's see here. So if I go back to my window, we'll need to, so this is all live. So our for loop went away. So if we have to do it again, uh, for layer in image. So here's a, we're back now where we started a for loop. Now we're inside the for loop. Um, see how, you know, just like we did this whoop scrolling up there. Um, all right. So we want to, I'll print layer again. Whoops, layer, we would have gotten an error from that. So we're still in the loop. We didn't leave it until we hit enter twice. So I can add another command. Um, um, layer image equals layer dot composite. All right. Is that the name of one of the layers? Um, so this is going through the layers. This doesn't need the names of, of the layers. Okay. So we would, so we could actually do a, an if statement to find that we selected the correct layer, right? Okay. So I guess we could do that. So um, why not? All right, fine. We'll we'll do this for one particular layer. So we'll we'll do. Um, all right. So so for layer and image. Um, Let's make sure we got this right. So layer dot name. Um, boom. Okay. Oh, wow. So now so just then, list all the names so of all the layers. Got it. So we want to grab, uh, do you see any? Uh, guitar. Guitar? Yeah. Okay. Nice. All right. Kind of. <laughs> all right. For layer and image, um, let's see. If layer dot name um, equals uh, guitar, um, uh, print um, I'm just going to say print, yay. So we found it. Let's make sure that this works. All right, so we found it. So we'll do, then we go for layer and image. If um, I was trying to cheat and go through my typing history, if layer name equals guitar, um, then we want to do layer image equals layer dot composite, which just sort of tells PSD tools to turn that into, you know, to render it basically. And then we'll do layer image dot save um, guitar dot png. Let's see, layer image dot save guitar. I'm making sure I typed it all correctly. Guitar dot png. Okay, so um, that should have worked. So now I'm. Uh, let's see if I can, oh yeah. All right. That's awesome. I need to share, how could I share this window then? Um, let's try this here. So let's do another source window capture and okay. And we'll say, okay. And then yep, you see that see, now? Yep. Seen it. Yeah. So there's a, there's a transparent yeah. PNG file made from the, the layer from yeah. the layer PSD file. Isn't that cool? That's really cool. That's really cool so, that you could do that without having a Photoshop installed on your computer at all. Yep. Nothing up my sleeve. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so it's not that, um, not that I don't find value or what have you in Photoshop. It's just, I was, I was paying for the $50 a month thing and I couldn't decide as far as which, which thing made sense to, to, you know, to downgrade to. So I decided to give it a, an experiment and, and walk away for, for a little bit and see what else existed in the ecosystem. Um, and you know, how I could, how I could manage that. So that, that's, um, yeah. 
So that's how, what. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask if so. I, could you explain, like, in the greater context, how this is b- creating efficiencies in working on game sprites and the integration of game sprites when you're working on Guitar Fretter? Do I have Guitar Fretter installed on this new machine yet? No. So how it helps is like you were showing the the screen in Guitar Fretter. Um, I can in the code for that uh, say load this image by name, right? And then that image has all the data in it. So it, as as my code loads it, it knows like oh the the guitar fretboard is a certain height and width. The guitar fretboard needs to be positioned at a certain x and y coordinate, and that just works right so i was able to do the 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 lifting of the of the design and the composition and the uh the layout in a visual tool right i was able to work fully visually and then pull the data from that visual layout and then use it in the game to sort of redisplay that right because the game is a series of explicit you know commands that are that don't know general things right like we could you could ask a person to say hey look at this image and position it right game doesn't know that game needs to you know there's no way to just instantly load a photoshop file in there right so how do i get that how do i go from the the work of composition and design and and uh, illustration to then go into it now it runs inside a game right Mm -hmm. so like that, you know, crossing that bridge is why this kind of automation is helpful. So for other other things, so like if you're creating assets for interactive projects, this is, a, this is going to be specifically what, what I just talked about, very useful, right? Because now you could, um, you know, export things, manipulate them to be, you know, higher, lower resolution, um, save it in a format that you want, uh, maybe change the naming convention, right? Because maybe you're working with a team and they're like, yeah, everything that goes on the start screen has to start with the word start. That's just how we work or whatever, right? You could easily make that change in your code and that's how it would get output. Boom, right? No extra work on your part. Um, and that's the point of the the automation aspect. So the the world where I don't do this means I have to then by hand say, all right, I have all these asset files and where do I want to, I need to load that one and give it a position. Oh, that's a wrong position. Oh, it's, it's a little too, it's native resolution is a little too big. I need to adjust that, whatever, right? So anyway, it's, it's, it's now just um, easily accessible uh, data. And this is- That was P- already baked in. PSD yep. tools, do I have the right site up? Mm-hmm. That's Python right. package yep. for working with Adobe Photoshop PSD files. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Did you did you want to see a little more, or are we? Yeah, let's do a, let's time? do a little bit more, and then and then we'll do another break, and then we'll close with uh, our two minute practice. So, all right. So let's hop over. I will switch to my Mac, and oh, that's funny. So. Um, let's see here. So what I, what you're seeing right here then is, is the window for the app called GIMP, right? And then, uh, then this window is, is, so, so GIMP is an image manipulation program that, um, it is open source and has been around for a long, long time, has, um, you know, a storied history and lots of twists and turns, but I would say overall, it's been, it's been growing and to be a more and more refined, easier and easier to use tool, roughly in the realm of an open source Photoshop. Um, and it, because it comes from that open culture, it very much has emphasized this sort of, um, well, go ahead and tinker with it um, ethos. So you have this thing called um, script foo baked into it. And then it's Python foo script uh, capability baked into it. And so you can uh, essentially get, well, this might look familiar. Oh, let me zoom in on it. Um, this is a, well, a Python console. Um, what's cool is it, um, you, let's see. So this is kind of like the same con- conceptual thing that we just did in the world of um, uh, like PSD tools 
and just raw Python, right? So this is Python embedded inside of um, GIMP and then having access to all of that GIMP can do. So then, well, now you, you can do lots of different, um, uh, so I like you can do that same kind of scripting and it just happens to be, it's like um, going to a different restaurant or going to a, um, whatever, uh, it's, it's going somewhere where they name things that are similar, but not exactly the same. And uh, so if I say, so, so notice I'm trying to, to get the image and there, I can't, right? Well, that means I have to, let me zoom back out and then I need to open up a, um, I'll open up the start screen with, with GIMP. And this is the start screen from, uh, that launches when you first launch the game Guitar Fretter. So there's a little bit of a, um, I need to decide about this color profile thing, but so far I've avoided that. So here you go. Here's the raw layout. Um, the fonts didn't, didn't pour over. So I need to, you know, make sure I got the, the right fonts there because, you know, those don't look correct. But there's all these labels and buttons and what have you and stuff. Not all of it is visible, of course, in the start screen. I can control that in the code. But um, here's all the, the finicky positions of all the things. And, um, and, so, and that, of course, is in, um, in layers. And uh, if I scroll this over a little bit, you you'll see that, you know, GIMP has roughly the, you know, the kind of, kind of tools you, you come to expect. And it's, um, I really, I'm impressed with how much, how it's been becoming a little more refined and a little more usable and polished by over the years. And it's, uh, I think it's, it's come a long way. Hmm. Um, so, okay, back to, you know, so, so this is just saying like, well, now I can have, I can basically automate my image app with Python. So now that there is an actual image loaded in the app, that didn't fail, right? So then if I do, if I just type image, you can see it has a reference to that, right? So then, um, let me think here, I'm trying to remember the, uh, let's see, do I have it in my history? Let's see here. I'm gonna do another for loop and go through the layers. All right. I'm going to need to zoom back out and look at my reminder list. Where is that thing? Here it is. So I will, uh, let's see. So I would do, well, very similar. Um, whoops. Uh, for layer in image dot layers. And uh, yeah, for layer in image dot layers. And then let's see, what do I want to, what data do I want to get from that? The big, the big gotcha here, I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in now. I have to remember, so it was do, do, do. Um, the big gotcha for this is like, I couldn't figure out, I could get layer name, I could, okay, I'm trying to zoom in, that's this button, here we go. All right. So I was puzzling out how to get, um, it's cause I could do print, um, and this is Python 2, so a little tweak in syntax here, print layer dot name, and I could do print layer, this was the gotcha, oh my gosh, I was trying to figure out on, on my Mac, how could I automatically get this data, and it was the X, Y position, I could get everything else, the layer width, the layer height, let's see, I'll, I'll just type Wait, that was literally the question I had, is like, can you figure out its actual, like, uh, absolute position on the image? And it's offsets, layer dot offsets. Mm. That was the gotcha. So I'm just going to hit that, enter, and then boom, you can see all this data come, come flying out. And all I need to do then is I can, I can turn this into, a, you know, put it into a text file and refer to it from my game. And it's all there, offsets, you see. So there's X and Y. Um, mm. That's, yep. And if you change so those in the text little, file, it'll automatically populate that in the actual game engine. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. nice. So I can work visually and export it into, into the game, which gives me, you know, it's, it, it's like trying to use each tool for its, its, um, what it's, it's better at, right? Mm -hmm. How can I, mm -hmm. you know, 
this along the, with our theme of this episode the the metaphor for those of us who aren't game designers is probably if you've ever manipulated css on your website hmm. right because like sure you're, sure you're dealing with that kind of thing all the time okay well that was my second demo any any other reactions or questions about that no that's that's really cool i mean that that uh what I'm getting from that is, is that instead of you having to go from the game engine to GIMP and back and forth to keep messing with it and then re-exporting it, you have the assets already like created as individual files that you can now, by having your master file and then writing that Python script, now you have the data so that you can just like make very fine-tuned minor adjustments on like image size and position without having to re-export everything. That's what I'm getting from that. Is that right? It's yeah, exactly. It's it's like um, sometimes if there's a tool that's that uh, a tool might be worth picking up if it gives more than it takes, right? And overall, this is giving me more than it takes. A little bit of scripting means I can continually refine a design. I don't have to. Um, I can reward learning and adapting and saying like, oh, this is actually more readable if I nudge it over here, or if I or if I actually change its 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 its, its size. It, because it creates a better um, sort of harmony and a visual emphasis and whatever, like whatever I'm learning as I interact with the game, I can act on that. And that's nice. Other tools like don't have to deal with this, but plenty of things do. Uh, if you're loading, uh, if you're loading assets like into a website because you're making something cool and interactive there, um, you may find visual ways to do that, but if you don't have a, if you need to go from your visual tool to your coding environment and there's no real bridge there, then something like this can sort of connect those two without, um, uh, and, and sort of, yeah, keep, keep you out of the business of, of um, getting mired into uh, trying to really do visual composition in a tool that doesn't do, do that well. Mm. That's great. Well, cool. I think we took a pretty broad walk around some different ways that like automation and shortcuts can make our lives a little bit easier when using digital tools. I think that's great. Um, do you feel like you're ready to take a break and then dive into two minute practice? Mm -hmm. I am ready. Okay. Let's yeah, let's take that break and uh, talk about what we what we practiced recently. And uh, who knows what might be next? Cool. All right. Well, in about a minute and a half to two minutes, we're going to come back and do that. And But first, we need to thank some people who make this show possible, and those people are us. We make the show possible. We make all sorts of things, and then we think really hard about them. We journal and dwell on our experiences making these things, and then we bring that thinking into this project we call Lean It's Art. The thing that I have worked on recently that I hope you will check out, and at the time of this broadcast slash recording, it's tomorrow is the thing I'm talking about, and that is the next episode of the Super Comics Challenge uh, video game show, uh, drawing game show with cartoonists, and I actually have like a one, like a forty-six second clip that I can play, uh, just to give people a taste oh, of what awesome. it's like. <laughs> like the like the Tonight Show. Do you have a clip? I have a clip. Uh, but yes, this is from the episode that's airing uh, Friday, uh, July seventeenth at noon Eastern Time, eleven a.m. Uh, Central Time, and it will remain on the Ann Arbor Art Center's Facebook page, so you can just follow them. It's it's literally just Ann Arbor Art Center on Facebook. But here is 47 seconds of the next episode of the Super Comics Challenge. I, Jersey, I, I had a question about the music while they're drawing. Yeah. Uh, I, I was under saying that, that the Super Comics Challenge had cleared the rights for uh, to play Nasty by Janet Jackson. Was, was that not the case? <laughs> <laughs> the, the call is still pending on that one and okay. you know I, I i picked this music thinking everybody was going to choose nice but instead they all chose nasty so now we have we have our first ironic round in the super comics <laughs> challenge otherwise you would have had nasty by janet jackson queued up because i would have i would have done the choreography in this limited space i have but i can't unless i have the music that's mr krasaska if you're nasty <laughs> Mr. Krasaska, if you can pronounce it Okay, so, so yes, that's the fun we have with the, the Super Comics Challenge game show, and you can watch it for free. It's a half hour long, and it's on the Ann Arbor Art Center's website. I, this is what we've been putting together, uh, given that we can't gather for uh, A2CAF this year. So we put together a bunch of video events instead, and uh, I'm, 
I'm pretty happy with the stuff that we put together and we made together. So, uh, Rob, you ha you do lots of other things. You have a store. I do, yeah, I do. So if you go to uh, robstenzinger.com slash store.html, you see that I have a variety of products and services I offer. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I have coaching. I can uh, work with you and your team, you individually or members of your team individually or all of you together to work through anything from coaching about uh, career paths or navigating difficult creative decisions or doing things like, well, leveling up your whole user-centered practice. So starting your user user experience system. And of course I've have the, um, the uh, creative product lab as well, which is sort of an ongoing journey through the cycle, whole creative cycle of making a product and making it a meaningful thing for your audience and for you. So then I also have workshops you can check out. Um, you can uh, get some easy links to those at robstenzinger.com slash store.html. Things like drawing user journey maps, customizing your next creative challenge and uh, goal setting using design plus storytelling and even the wonderful chill out break fun time of sketching the happiest kitty in the universe. All of these are available through my Gumroad store, but they're also available through Skillshare. So if you do a search on Skillshare.com for my name, or if you use any of those links to go to Skillshare from store.html, right? You can, uh, and you're, you're new to Skillshare, you, you can get like a, uh, like a two month free uh, thing for signing up and, and being a new member. So there you go, check out all those things I have to offer, other links to, you know, convenient links to the games and things I do too. And uh, I appreciate you, um, you know, doing business with the things I offer. Uh, could you just spend like 20 seconds talking about the, pr the product practice lab? Because I, I, I feel like this is an exciting new addition to the store that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about. Yeah. Um, so I have a many, many dozens of different possible exercises to facilitate through, um, you know, making small, safe, creative activities to think through uh, designing a product and, and anywhere or evolving an existing one. And so the lab is a place to um, it's a place to practice, learn and grow as a product maker. And uh, again, working through a whole cycle of things, well, whether that's um, doing secondary research, primary research, um, working through many concepts, and then trying to find that matchmaking through through the the uh, like maybe you have too many ideas ideas for products to work on next. Well, what fits your strategy the best? Where do you want to go next? And there's I have all sorts of exercises for working through those kinds of decisions and. Um, you know, continuing your process, getting your ideas out into the world. So that's what that product lab is all about practicing. Cool. All right. So that's at robstenzinger.com slash store.html. And the other thing that we hope you'll check out today is the Lean Into Art Discord, where we are streaming live right now. Um, we have a forum now. And the really, I'm so grateful for it because the conversations that are happening in there are generating topics for the Lean Into Art cast. Not because we've exhausted all the topics, but because sometimes we get into sort of like a lane in the work that we're doing and we forget about other interesting aspects of the work because we're not engaged with it on the ground the way everybody else is. Everybody's doing, approaching it from different directions. And so... Hmm, involving your users in your product helps your learning and adaptation. This is living that very model right here. That's so idea, because yeah. inherently you get you can get locked into some perspective that... that uh, we got we have one brain and one 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 sort of pile of senses and and neural physical reality that we work through but turns out you can do more robust things when you include more people that that can they can bear the load of all the different perspectives because they have things they care about and we listen and uh you know that's that's perfect because yeah. somewhere there's an overlap where it's like gosh that would actually make a good topic and that's what happened this week. And so, yeah, we there's an invite link in the show notes for this episode and every episode. Uh, please join us in the Lean Into Art Discord. There are three public channels, and then there's the Patreon-only channels where we do the live streaming. And uh, Ashley is in the Discord right now and commenting on when we were doing the the, the break, said, uh, the Super Comics Challenge was really cute. I loved the blast. The last episode, the car crash sound effect was crazy. Uh, yeah, so part of the, the Super Comics Challenge model is I try to bring in a 
very young artist, like a child, like an 11 to 12 year old who like is serious about making comics, usually former students of mine. And then bring in somebody who's been doing this a few years, but is not like they have less than say 15 years experience making comics. And then I try to bring in a master and a master is somebody I would define as somebody who has 20 years of applied experience or more doing this. And then, so in the case of the episode one, that was Greg Shegel was my master. And the master is there to take all of the brutal hits, right? And so like we do a round where we do sound design, everybody gets a different, I play a sound on the screen or on the show and they have to design a sound based on what they heard. And so, you know, it's like the other two contestants got like, oh, you get like a rooster crowing, here's a gong being hit. Not, not insurmountable, but but challenging, but not like super challenging. And then Greg, I play a like minute and a half long car crash where it's like it sounds like a twenty two car pileup, and you hear like trucks going by, you hear glass tinkling. And, and Greg leaned right into he he totally got what I was trying to do there. As he leans right into it, he starts. You see him like dancing with his fingers while he's listening to the sound. And at the end, I'm like, do you need to play? Do you need to play it again, Greg? And he's like, oh, please don't. <laughs> So, yes, that's the, part of the, the game is it's not about winning a game, really. It's about just playing together um, and, and, and getting people from different experience levels to all interact in a forum like that. And that, that, that really is like the spirit of a 2 calf. So I'm, 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 I'm glad that Ashley watched it. Uh, the second episode, I play a similar trick <laughs> on my master. Um, and, and Jared Krasoska was just a brilliant commentator. He brought a lot of fun to the show. So I, I know that you will enjoy it if you check it out uh, on Friday at noon. Okay. It's a, it is a really fun show. We, we watched the first episode as a family. And it was one of those things where I thought, oh, it's going to, you know, I, let's check it out for a few minutes. And the... Uh, you know, it just, I don't know what it was. Like we were about to, you know, transition from, you know, after supper, we we're going to play some board games or something. And the kids were like, nah, board games can wait. This is great. And they, it was, it was a lot of fun. That's so awesome. It was uh, very much like a whole family, uh, good time, impressive, awesome project Jersey. Thanks. And, and I'm grateful that you were able to step in to be the Rod Roddy of the show with your press your luck voice at the top <laughs> and at the back end. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, very small, but it was, it was neat to, to it was neat to, to, you know, contribute that. So thanks for, thanks for asking. All right. Uh, so it's time for the two minute practice. So two minute, slash two minute practice. Um, this is the, the, the experiment that we conduct where we try to find, uh, ways to inexpensively add new practice to our our work weeks. And what was our... Oh, by the way, hi, Rob. Hi, Jersey. <laughs> Two-minute practice time, hey? Yes, it is. Um, well, I think that's fantastic. I, I This is such a... This has been a lot of fun. Like, how, how has this overall been going for you, these two-minute things, the... the, the I have not been successful at instituting it at a specific time of day, right? Like, I feel like, like mm. we've talked about this before. It's like when it comes to any kind of thing that you want to turn into a habit, like they say with running, it's like you should run at the same time every day. Um, I'm not, I haven't found a way to where I can block out that two minutes. It really feels like it's something that happens in between other things. And I put it on my emergent task planner every day. And it's like, sometimes I hit it, sometimes I don't. I did, I did do it a couple times this week. And I would say, broadly speaking, aside from the fact that I haven't been able to make it like a, a, a true habit, um, I'm finding that I'm getting value out of it every time in the sense of training myself to um, whittle in a way that, um, where I can shuffle off the initial panic of trying to accomplish something in a very short amount of time. I'm getting comfortable mm -hmm. with the idea of let's see how much I can do in an amount of time versus I have to get X done in a certain amount of time. Like the dynamic is very different. Uh, that's how, how interesting that, that it's, that was part of its, uh, the, the origin, the ri origination of this was to try to push against that idea to be playfully, you know, coexistent with, yeah, you might be productive if you do something in two minutes, but it, that's incidental. The, the intention and likely outcome, it's just different experience. 
and uh, just knowing the constraints of it, like realistically, that's that's the more reasonable thing to 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 expect of saying like I'm going to practice something for two minutes at a time, and I have an idea that I'll try for multiple days, maybe seven in a row. I'll let's see what happens, and but to expect like a product at the end, it's probably not going to work. So in a way it was, this was all hacking our overall, how we deal with creative challenges and saying like, where do we, you know, where can, where, where can we go different with that? Because, you know, sure is, sure is tempting to, to be productive and, you know, produce a thing. Yeah. Yeah. But, so I guess it, it, the short version is, is that I'm, I'm being shaken from my, um, uh, my, my grasping at, only feeling good about something when I have something to show for something, but like, like defining myself through mm -hmm. my productivity. I, I'm it's, it's found, you found a new way to shake that branch. So I, I'll just finally let go of it and accept that there's, there's some, some, some things that are <laughs> sure, meant to be. That's a thing. It's a scheme. This whole thing is like, surprise. <laughs> I'm trying to, it, you know, like do this quirky thing for my friend as, and literally I'm shaking you like, because as, it's as all about me. Rob. grip. Yeah. <laughs> It is though too. Like I, it was very much a huge influence because of how much I admire when you do a creative challenge jersey. I don't know how. Like you have found for years and years a way to turn creative challenges into products, and I just sit there mouth agape after <laughs> after a few weeks where I'm like, look at him go. It's a bunch of pages for a book. What the heck? All I have is these weird animal things. Like and like. 10 different themes among a pile of doodles. What am I going to do with this? Right. And so anyway, welcome to my master scheme. Two minute <laughs> All right. Well, so what, now all that said, what was our challenge this week? So we chained a challenge again in a way, because it, we had a brainstorm about gratitude in our, in our previous practice, but then that turned into something more specific about brainstorming, um, gratitude that is about the people who helped you on your path. And then ideally turn that into action. So, you know, reaching out and showing and sharing that gratitude to, to those people. So, mm -hmm. I, which you practiced yeah. how, and uh, I did. How'd it go for you? Uh, it went, um, how do I say? It's like, uh, so you ever listen to an album enough where you get deeply attached to it and you go past a certain point of thinking like, I'm, I've heard this so many times, I'm now not going to be as into it somehow. I'm going to, I've just heard it too much. I've wasted the flavor of this experience. But instead, it actually goes deeper. Mm. And... And like, oh crap, now this album makes me cry. Yeah. And good news, you know, it's just fine. It's just like, well, wow. Um, this this was a hard practice because uh, you know, I went from like the casual version of the brainstorm and here's the functional, here's how I could do it in the situations, to I went back through my path and uh oh, I am very lucky in so many ways, and it's overwhelming. You know what I mean? Like if I think about, I go, I went, you know, my, I can't, I, I don't want to share mine because it's too personal. I don't, I don't know because I, my first phases, I did this in one, two, three. I'm glad I switched different colors with my markers. So I know how many, how many um, practice sessions, I think it was four, four sessions. I did the path brainstorming. But then in a fifth session, I did the people brainstorming of those points along the path, right? So I started along my path where I went, you know, childhood, teen, young adult, entrepreneur. So like, and the sometimes projects and products would just come out of like, oh, wow, this is really affecting. Like, and, and it was like a positive building block toward where I am right now. If I think about something that, that I experienced that I would then pick up and look at and say, yeah, it's part of me. So this thing of um, like for two years, I was in junior achievement, which is a, like a, like a business. It, um, uh, it, it's like practicing doing a business in high school, right? That was pretty influential to me. I don't know the names of the volunteers of that thing. I, but like they, they provided me a, a pretty awesome experience that 
um, I learned a ton about like going into therapy that, that like I had a mega awesome breakthrough kick butt therapist in my early twenties. Right. And then on and on. Right. So er, then it's, or it's like professional career, but it was like, I didn't do every single fine grain thing I felt good about from my young, you know, childhood, whatever team, whatever. But it was like these particular elements that were like part of building my path as, as a creative professional being, right? Mm -hmm. That path in particular. Mm -hmm. So if it was like, if I, um, it contributed to, to my makeup as a, as an artist, as a game creator, as a designer, a coder, a collaborator, um, a learner, a teacher, right? So anyway, um, it goes, yeah. And then there's, yeah, I guess good, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, I guess it's a long path cause I'm old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a bunch of things along the path that I could go into more specifics, but I think about like early jobs and people who taught me certain things. Right. Cause I, I purposefully didn't say like, if something came to mind where it was like, that was, that was hard and negative. And I grew a lot. I didn't include that on this list. Right. Mm -hmm. I tried to keep to the ones that were the like more building and uh, I like how I've become because of not in spite of or in, in, instead of. Right. So that's what informed this, this path. I don't know. It, what, what are you, what, where I don't know where to go with. This. Well, I mean, it so, was very personal. It was very intense. Same here. Yeah, and and um, I mean, I, I had a similar experience where I was just connecting myself with a path. You know, it's like I remember in a, a Joseph Campbell interview, he talks about how like when you get older, you have this sense of everything happened the way it was supposed to, and you know, it's like mm, maybe. I, that sounds a little bit getting close to woo woo for me. I think it's a sense of it, an inevitability will reveal itself just through the fact that every, every event is connected to another event. So because of that, because of that, because of that, because of that, right now, while, so not to totally demystify it and t turn it into some kind of like cynical sort of approach, like, well, you know, events ca cause and effect happens and then therefore there's the, where you are. But what I did notice is that things that I am doing now I was charting the course of where they began and, and, sh and feel and mm. discovering how interconnected all the events really are. So that things that were chance meetings, say in 2007, I could, I found the river to where I am right now doing exactly what I'm doing at this exact moment. Like what I'm doing right this moment is a result of a chance meeting that happened in 2007. And it has nothing to do with you per se, right, Rob? Like that this is before you and I met, right? But it's like thinking of these experiences and these people um, helped me map that a little bit more clearly in a way that I hadn't articulated it recently. So that was good. Uh, that reflection was good. But there was another element that I discovered through the urgency of the two-minute practice is that I found myself writing um, specific behaviors that these people in my life demonstrated. And oh. so instead of it just being like, oh, I met this person and this good thing happened, it was like, what did they do specifically that put me on this path, right? So I was also sort of collecting, and I, I did it on sticky notes again, because I always do it on sticky notes. Um, mm -hmm. I, was, I was collecting sort of, a, sort of a cloud of characteristics of people who have been helpful in my life. Um, and once again, finding like clear articulation for what kind of behaviors uh, do I find are especially valuable. Um, and valuable in the sense that they put me where I am, or put me where I am, that's a little bit too succinct and a little bit too uh, reductive. I mean, they were either guides, influences, or outright forces that helped me to navigate to where I am right now, for better mm. or worse. <laughs> Often, I, I, I was leading for better for the most part. But, um, and, and learning, also learning how these different guides in my life had very different dispositions, right? So I've had people who are very gentle, leading by example people in my life. I've had people who just did not put up with my nonsense, in my life. I had people who, who looked me in the eye and said, I'm not paying you to, to not share your expertise. You, you show up tomorrow, you share your expertise, you have it, and I'm paying for it, provide it. 
you know? And it was really frightening in the moment when that happened. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I really let these people down. And then it was also, it was this really loving but tough way of saying, don't you dare hide behind false modesty, right? You, you don't get to do that with me. And like, and like I, I, I thought of that moment and that, that particular um, presence of mind that this person had in my life. Um, and, you know, it's like, it's like this is a lesson that I continue to keep on learning and I hope to live up to the example that they, they led for me, you know? So, yeah, it was also very, it was very deeply personal, but like I was grateful that it was a, um, you know, a way to put some specificity to um, positive experiences in my journey. Mm. The specificity, like for me, the, the that sounds so useful. Like in, in those characteristics, I almost want to go back through this again. But um, and I sigh when I when I say that, I uh, I I definitely didn't include the for worse, but I just kept the for better, and. And then I found it was events. It was adventures. It was a series of like, overall, my path is a, is a series of stuff I was involved in making. Right. And, and that's, that was the emphasis, like all the stepping stones in the, in the arrows pointing along the way. Um, it's mostly stuff I, I, I made and was, or yeah, it was part of making where yeah, sometimes it was just being part of, um, like the junior achievement thing is as an example, like our products sucked, like we didn't make good products. Um, but like, it was a powerful experience. So I guess that's, um, yeah, I guess that's the other, that's the other in is like, if it was powerfully influential. Um, and then I found, I don't know what to say, but like, I feel like there's a, a handful of people that, I feel ridiculously humbled and I don't know, I have so much gratitude and a good fortune. I don't, I'm, st I have to figure out how the heck to even express it. Like mm. I, I, I just was like, Oh, as, as I pieced the, like there's a, a couple of individuals in particular where looking back, I'm like, where in the heck would I even be if I didn't know this person? Yeah. Like it's, it's just stunning. Just, shocking where i'm like this person has done has been this this nudge or guide or influence or flat out um push or what have you at different times and i'm like it's it's humbling where you think about like because i don't like i don't have that joseph campbell perspective of of uh well it's all as it meant to be um I feel good about the path. I can find the causality in the narrative, but I don't find it as um, immutable. Right? It's like I can, I can trace my path as a pinball in these different pinball games. Yeah. But like I could have, I could have went boom, boom instead of ba bong or da doo against some other thing in the game. Right? The playing surface and the chaos and the and the physics and the the timing. There's so much going on. So I, I wouldn't feel it's like, and that's how it was meant to be. <laughs> right. I feel like right, a yeah. lucky, lucky, lucky pinball. Yeah. Yes. Same here. Um, l l luck to a degree that I wouldn't even be able to put words to when I was 16 years old and saying, I'm going to be a comic book artist someday, you know? Um, yeah. It, it, in another way, it was also like playing It's a Wonderful Life, but with the other people in your life, like imagining what your life would be like without them. Um, mm. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, it was, it was a very rewarding exercise and it, it also helped me sort of just help get a little bit more of a map of where I am as a creative person and where I've been. Mm. So well, how, how do you feel about that? So that map, like, you know, now you, now you have it, like, did you then put a lot of it to use as far as reaching out or not yet? Not yet, but I mean, okay. it, 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 I do have, well, like you said, like, well, how do you express it? Well, I have a list of <laughs> characteristics and specific moments. Like, this is the way they behaved, and these are the things they did. I can name them now, mm -hmm. and so, like, this will be, make it a lot easier to send a postcard to somebody saying, like, hey, here's three things you did that, like, profoundly affected who I am, and I will never be able to repay it, and I'm so grateful that you are who you are, and you were where you were when I met you. Yeah. Mm. That is pretty beautiful, man. <laughs> yeah, I um, think so. 
I, th I think it's I think it's something that you know we could all practice uh, a little bit more, especially in, well, not especially, just all the time. I'm not gonna say especially now, all the time. Why would why do we have to be wait for like good times, bad times? It doesn't matter. It is it is distinct and apart from whatever the characteristic of the time that you're living in is. It's just something that should be a, a reflex in our lives. Hmm. What? I'm so, I'm so past due and have atrophied this reflex. I'd have to, yeah, I, I, I look forward to getting better at it and, and developing it in the hopes that it will become reflexive. Yeah. Well, that's what practice is for. So what do we, what do mm. you want to practice this time? Do we want to do something sillier, <laughs> a little less intense? Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if we end door number one, how about you dig even deeper? No, oh. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the I'm door good. with the goat I, behind it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm fine that I might get exactly in. Let, let's make a deal. Monty Hall style presentation. There's a good chance I'll end up with a goat if I make a choice <laughs> now. So um, anyway, what? Um, let's see. So we've done a lot of visual practice. We've done, <laughs> we've definitely caught up a bit on the sort of, um, uh, I guess, uh, life and reflective practice stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what has been, let's see. So what do you think about different um, sort of mm, like rapid sketching techniques and like, like brainstorming wise, like I find like some of some things are very brainstorm compatible in my opinion, but like, I don't know if this is a two minute practice or a lean into art thing where it's like sometimes drawing with silhouettes is super relaxing and interesting to me where it's experimental and I discover stuff mm -hmm. or other times, sometimes drawing with it, like the symmetry tool, right. In a digital where, where it's like, I, I have a ruler that, that my lines are mirrored on. That's kind of fun and relaxing. Um, but like, it feels so specific, right? So is there like a, mm, cause there, there's this other thing, activity I did with the kids a, a couple weeks back where we were making some cards for some folks. And then, um, uh, I had them essentially cut out random shapes, but then really repeatedly and easily turn that into a face. Cause if you fold it in half and you cut a little triangle mouth and you use a whole a paper punch and go, mm, you put it and all of a sudden, boom, you have two eyes and a little mouth. And it's really, um, there's harmony, even though there's a lot of variety, right? I don't know. What do you think of all these words? Is there a practice in there? Well, I mean, I'm Im imagining, and this is something I see a lot of artists do. As a matter of fact, Brandon Dayton did this uh, for sketchbook summer is this idea of like, just draw like a shape, like a head shape and just see how many faces you can make out of it, right? Ah, okay. So like you just That's draw cool. like a, a bean shape, a round shape, a triangle shape, whatever shape you want four times or however many you can do in two minutes and see how many different faces you can make out of that shape. Uh, I see a lot of nice. artists doing this on Instagram. Um, Krishna Sadasavam is another artist I think of who does this a lot. Um, oh, I, think, yeah. I think it's a good warm up. I think putting it in, in, in the context of two minutes, um, makes it very affordable. So like, you're not like trying to do like 20 heads. You just do, see what you can do. Like two minutes is what? 120 seconds. Uh, four heads is 30 seconds a head, right? Like if you wanted to break it down that, that way, budget it out. Right. But like, just like draw like a, a shape is a, a number of times. See how many heads you can make out of it. Different heads. Right. So same, the variety is in the exploration of the, of that shape. Mm -hmm. And okay. I, and like I always say to like my students, turn it sideways, turn it upside down, look at it, you know, from a variety of angles, see what you can find in there. Mm -hmm. Sounds relaxing too. Like a nice low pressure doodling thing. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds, that sounds really nice. All right. Uh, let's cool. do that. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Jersey. And I think that that means we have done another walk around a topic and a podcast. Uh, so thank you, Rob, for this week's discussion. Thanks to the folks in the Discord who provided us with the inspiration for this topic. Um, it's so helpful to know what you're working on and what you're thinking about as means to give us for food for thought to bring to this project called Lean It Art. 
And uh, we record the show Thursdays at noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central. And we right now are streaming it on Discord and then collecting it as a podcast at leanintoart.com and patreon.com slash leanintoart. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, I've been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and Rob Stenzinger places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.